Hello everybody and welcome to the Ask Abhijit show. It is that time of the week again. It's time for the Ask Abhijit show and we are back after a gap of a week. So it's wonderful to be back once again amongst you all. As always, let us see who all is there on the live stream. I can see Nikhil, Bimla, Electron, Pumindui, Tejas, Rick, Prince Namdeo, Ayush, Swami Mishra, Sharma, Serious Student Pro Max, <laughs> Crypto Gyan Whiteboard, Ankita Jha, Om Bekherikar, Gopinath, Subho, Lakshika Singh Soda, Naman Panchal, Shashank, Totan Chaudhary, Rahul Seth, Aditya Singh, Nirmal, Shaili, Shivam, Priyanshi, Exasperated Farago, Fatty Just Ate, Neuro, Dr. Jayashankar Supremacy, GK, Chinggis Khan, Kalam, Karan Nalavat, Obi Wan, Moksha, Prabhav, Shivansh, Va- Van- Vansh, Lalit Singh Rawat, Night Shed Gaming, Martian, Brijesh, Hajmola Singh, Aman Saini, Suraj Sur, Ruchika, Batman, Ronald, Tejo Meg, Dhruv Kumar DK, Matheo Perez, Tejas, Bai, Durga, Chiching, Abhishek, Time Destroyer of All, Sumit Bhattacharji, Sai Nikhil, Spaceman, Nikhil, Rushi, Abir Banerjee, Sanjay Kumar Singh, Siddhartha, Pankaj, One of Spot, Naman, Liger, Ritwik Sardesai, Bibek Haldar, Harmonica, Hero, Akash, Narendra Bhai Modi, <laughs> Naman Panchal, Aman, Sanjay, Joel the Dreamer, uh, and lots of other people, Subham Parth, Mortis, RTK, De- Debam, Lia Banerjee, Raja Kumar, SS Pala Application, Take my name, sir. Yeah, that's your name. Saujanya, Teja, Sanidya, Akshat, Devang, Manju, Matthew, Tushar, Sharan, Shahin, Vahman, Zadigan, Ax, Jay Dikshit, Joseph Stalin, Ajay Reddy, Ratan, everybody else, everybody else. Let me stop here. If you're already three minutes into the show. So, uh, greetings to you all and thank you so much for being on this live stream. I hope you're doing fantastically well. So, uh, as as i'm sure you all know this uh, this episode is in this episode i'm going to take take questions from the live chat uh, i'm going to bring back eventually the episodes in which i take questions pre pre selected questions from the comments that you all ask uh, that you ask in the comments but uh, i believe that uh, this uh, this format in which i take questions live from the live chat is actually good because you know it gives the opportunity to more people to ask questions and lots of people say that uh, you know I only take a, f- a few questions from the, the from the uh, comments. So this is more interactive. It gives it gives more people the opportunity to interact uh, with me and with everybody else. So uh, this is fun, actually, you know. So uh, so let's keep doing this for some time. So uh, yeah, let's let's get into the questions. I'm sure there's a lot to discuss. There's lots happening in the world. Uh, so g- go for it. Start asking your questions, and let's see how many I can take. Tejas says, what's the mystery about human-like statues on Easter Island? How did people even go there in the first place? Yeah, where is Easter Island? Yeah, the time for the map. Time for the map. Where is the map? Come on, let's bring the map in and take a look. So where is Easter Island? We know where India is. Go east, east, east. Go east, go east of Australia. Go into the South Pacific Ocean. Easter Island is a tiny island somewhere near, reasonably near Chile. It's called Rapa Nui. Let's let's search for it. R A P A N U I. Where is it? So it's part of Chile. I think it, it belongs to the nation state of Chile for whatever reason. But here we are. So this is okay. So once again, let me zoom out just for reference to understand where it is. It's in the in the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, the South Pacific Ocean, enormous territory of the earth where there's almost nothing except a few scattered islands. And there is this one island there called Rapa Nui, also called Easter Island for whatever reason. Whatever reason, it's called Easter Island. And it belongs to the nation state of Chile. So let's zoom in now and let's see what is the size of this island. As you can see, it's a reasonably small island. Let's measure the distance from end to end. From here to here, it's about 23 kilometers. And from here to here, not to south, it's about 12, 13 kilometers. So that's the size of this island. That's how large it is. It's 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 quite small actually and we have these moai these human statues human like statues called moai on this island i'm sure if we search for it you will find it somewhere moai there's an airport here um 
and I'm sure it's it's somewhere. I'm not gonna look. At, okay, Moai is something here, right? Let's let's take a look quickly if we can see some of these things. All uh, right. Okay, so I'm not gonna. Maybe it's these these little. Yeah, here you are. There you are. You see these these shadows and these statues. So these are the human-like statues that you find on this island. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out and let's talk. Let's talk about this. Uh, so let's let's see what these statues look like. Let's go to Google search and search for Moai. Uh, Easter Island Moai. Easter Island Moai. So this is this is what the statues look like. You know, huge, large statues. I'm sure many tons in weight. That's what it looks like, and they are more than half buried under the earth. So it actually represents entire human figures. As you can see here, this gives you a better idea. So that's what it is about. So what's the deal with these human-like statues on Easter Island? This this island is uh, essentially uninhabited now. So what happened is that, I don't know, a long time ago, it is the Polynesian people who made their way to this island. They, they, they migrated across the vast, the vast expanse of the almost empty Pacific Ocean. How they managed to reach there, it's it's a big mystery, as you as we just saw on the on the map. It's very isolated, but they reached there. There was a significant, sizable population of people there, Polynesian peoples, the Easter Island people, and they had their own script. I think it's called the Rongo Rongo script. It it is suspiciously, it is strangely. Uh, Reminiscent of the Saraswati Sindhu script, actually, very strange. It looks similar in some ways. And they had these massive statues statues. So, because they are all dead, the entire population has been wiped out. I don't know when it happened. It happened at least a couple of centuries ago. Uh do, do some of them still survive? Maybe some of them may survive on Chile or something. In Chile, I'm not sure. I don't think any of them still survives. Maybe some descendants who are not pure blood may survive, perhaps. But overall, the people died out because uh, it's a small island, as we saw. It can only sustain a certain amount of people, certain number of people. And eventually, these people, they used up all the resources of the island and there was nothing left, no vegetation, no animals, whatever. And eventually, you know, that caused the collapse of the society and the population there. And eventually, the, the, the Europeans made their way there. And once Europeans reach somewhere, essentially, you know, nothing, nothing survives. The Europeans are... Well, historically, we know how they have been. They, they've wiped out entire continents. North America, South America, Australia. So what is Easter Island? Uh, so these uh, statues that we see there, the, the Moai statues, they represent their culture, their belief system, maybe their gods or, or their ancestors or great people they wish to worship. We're not quite sure. We're not quite clear. There are theories, obviously. You you look it up online, you will, you will find multiple theories of what these statues represent. But nobody has been able to reach any consensus or any definitive conclusion yet because the original culture no longer exists. It is only they who can tell us what this really represented and they are gone. So it's still a mystery. Maybe it will remain a mystery. And, you know, all this historical research is typically done from a Eurocentric perspective. And when you do things, if, when, you, when you study a non-European culture from a Eurocentric and way, Occidentalist perspective, you're going to mess things up. So most historians have a very strong Eurocentric bias, including... Indian historians, and that's why this mystery is is you know is still a mystery, and maybe it will remain a mystery, un un unless we're able to decipher the script. Perhaps I'm not sure the script has been deciphered. So that's what it's all about. It's a mystery. We don't have the answers. No historian. Some historians claim to have the answer, but you know there has to be a proper consensus, and consensus has to be based not on opinions but on actual evidence and data. So a lot of evidence is missing. The people are no longer there. And that is why it is a mystery. All right. Great question to start with. Let us see something else. Let us see other questions. Uh, Aditya Gupta says, please express your views on slowing economic growth, the so-called Hindu rate of growth. So to say, compared to previous quarter, what could we could be done to reverse this? Listen, I'm not sure if the rate of growth today is slowing down. Hindu rate of growth. I mean, that's the Nehruvian rate of growth. That the for the, the lost decades of India's history after 1947, in which India's economy grew at, at a measly 2%, 3%, maybe 4% at max per year, because of the socialistic policies imposed by the great magnificent Mr. Nehru. 
That was the Nehruvian rate of growth. And it is certain Indian economists and Western economists who coined the term Hindu rate of growth to make fun of Hindus and to, you know, demean India's culture. So when a nation, when India's economy grows at 2%, 3% of per year, three maybe 4%, that's what you would term as a Nehruvian rate of growth. Now, how do you properly assess the growth of a nation? You don't look at it day by day or week by week or month after month or quarter by quarter. You have to see it over an extended period of time, at, at least one year at a time. Right? So this year, India's economy is projected to grow at what percent? Around 6% per year, that's what the IMF or World Bank say. That's okay. That's their projection. That's their projection. And maybe, you know, over a, in, in a year, there are four quarters. Maybe one quarter the nation may not do, may not, you know, the economy may not grow very fast. Another quarter, it may grow at 13% per year. Something like that happened last year, right? Because of the kickstarting of the economy after the, the uh, lockdowns of the coronavirus disaster. So we have to assess the growth of a nation over an extended period of time, minimum one year. So let's wait until the end of the year. Let's forget about the projections. Projections are very useful, which which tells you this, which gives you a sense of how the economy is going to fare. It's good to have projections, but the assessment has to be done not based on projections, but on actual data. And we have to do it year after year. And of course, the ones who are running the country need to see it day, day by day, week by week, month by month, quarter by quarter. But for us, we should take a look at it year after year, one year at a time. That gives you a proper, balanced, objective understanding of how the economy is doing. Because, you know, there are recalibrations and, and pivots that are done on a week-by-week -week basis based on certain things. New investments come in, certain things don't work well. You have, that, that's, you know, like if you are, if you're the captain of a ship, so the actual performance of a captain, you you don't see it minute by minute or, 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 you know, hour after hour. There may be storms, there may be squalls, there may be, you know, strong winds. Things happen. So you have to see it over a period of time to actually assess the, the performance of a captain, how well he or she is, you know, uh, captaining and leading. So I, I would say that let's take a, let's, let's, uh, not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we have, let's wait until the end of the year and assess on December 31st or maybe financially, whatever, whichever way you want to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think overall the Indian economy is doing very well. India's economy, I would say, is poised for a takeoff. All the infrastructure we have been building over the past eight, nine years, all the reforms we've done, we have, uh, you know, the GST, it's old news, obviously, but this is the, going to be the foundation for the Indian economy taking off. The the uh, the cashless the, the UPI system that's in, that's been brought in and so many other things you know I think India's economy is actually poised for a takeoff the only bright spot in the world currently and for the sustainable uh, for the for the foreseeable future is going to be India China is is contracting China's economy is really slowing down even if they are projected to to grow at five point six percent of whatever for the next year or whatever, as per the IMF and World Bank, I don't really, I, I take these, these projections and statistics with a very large serving of salt. Because the Chinese are well known for, for putting out doctored manufactured data. You cannot ever trust their figures and their statistics and their claims. Okay, the Chinese economy is actually doing very poorly right now. The last couple of years, it actually most likely contracted despite whatever figures they have put out. And it's going to only intensify because of the impending demographic disaster that they, they are, there's no way for them to escape that. Because of decades of the one-child policy, now the, it's, it's going to come home to roost, you know, all the, all the fruits of their harvest. Uh, so even if they implement a five-child policy now, it's too late. It's too late. By 2100, their population will be half of what it is now, and it will the average age will be well into the 60s. The average person in China will be over 60 years old. By 2050, by 2050, the average Chinese person will be 58 or 57 years old. Can you imagine that a nation of old people? Who's gonna who's gonna sit in the tanks? Who's gonna fly the fighter planes? Who's gonna man that enormous navy they are building? Who's going to be in the submarines? All geriatric old people? No, they will find young people to do that. But you know, it, it significantly decreases the vitality of a nation when everyone's old. I have nothing against old people, but that's simply how it is. But the Chinese have destroyed an entire strata of their population, of their society. You can see it if you see any chart 
of the Chinese population by by age group, you know, zero to five, five to ten, ten to fifteen, fifteen to twenty, and so on, all the way up to to hundred. You will see massive sections where you know there are there are gaps. That you know, the 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 Chinese population that grew up during the so-called Great Leap Forward in the Cultural Revolution, etc. There are big gaps there. India's population curve is very smooth. The Chinese population curve is like messed up. So all these horrible policies that they implemented, they are now showing their effects. So China is not going to do well. The only economy which can surpass the US in maybe by 2060 or 2070, at, at the latest, is India. There's no other economy that can do that. Not China for sure. So overall, long term, India's India's story. This is going to be in the Indian century. Let's not look at it quarter upon quarter. That is a very short term way of looking at things. If you want to look at any person's development or any nation's development or any city or state's development, you have to have a reasonably long term perspective. So I think it's going fine. I am not. I I have not seen the the whatever claims are being made apparently. Looks like from from this comment that uh, economic growth may be slowing, but I don't. I, I am not concerned in the least. I think we are, we are in we are in good hands. Okay. Chirag says, my friends say democracy was found in Greece, but being your viewer, I know it was found in India, Janapada and Mahajanapada. How can I explain the truth to them? So, okay, a good question. Eh? Uh, democracy in Greece. So, uh, how how do we assess? You know. What was the state of democracy in India and in Greece? So, you know, the West says that uh, if you look at the Western world, the Americans, the, the British, etc., they say that the West is a civilization, Western civilization. And uh, its foundations are Greece and Rome. That's what they say. Their foundations actually are the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, all that, but they want to disown that because there was a horrible time and their ancestors were responsible for that. So they try to claim that, you know, it is Greece and Rome and maybe Mesopotamia and Egypt that have contributed to uh, Western civilization. And they said that the Western civilization is the birthplace of democracy because Greece apparently is the birthplace of democracy. So let's take a look at Greece. Let's examine Greece. Your friends who say that democracy is, was found in Greece, why don't you ask them a simple question? When somebody makes a claim, you ask you, you have to ask ask a couple of questions. Ask the question: When did democracy arise in Greece? In which century or in which millennium? The first millennium, the second millennium, when was it? Secondly, where exactly? In which city-state did democracy arise? If they don't have the questions, you need to tell them to go, please go and instead of giving opinions, find some simple facts. Easily. Uh, you know, discoverable facts. In which city-state did, did democracy arise? And then the question is, what form did this democracy take? Were women allowed to vote? Were all citizens, adult citizens allowed to vote? Or were only men allowed to vote? And if women were not allowed to vote, only men were allowed to vote, then which men were allowed to vote? Which, what section of the adult male population had a say in elections? Mm -hmm. Was it every male? Or maybe where the, was the significantly large slave population excluded from that? If you have slavery, are you a democracy, by the way? A nation which has slavery, can you call it a democracy? Slaves have no rights, including the right to property, the right to privacy, the right to life. Slaves have no right. A nation which practices slavery can never, ever, 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 ever be called a democracy. Please get that through your heads, first of all. The definition of democracy is that the entire adult population gets the right to vote and stand in elections also. That's the simplest definition of democracy. It's, it's more nuanced than that, but this is the simplest, you know, you, this is how you would explain democracy to a, to a five-year-old. That the entire adult population, male as well as female, etc., have the right not only to vote, but to stand for election. Was this the case in Greece? Slaves, there was a significant slave population they did not have the right to vote or the right to life. They could be killed any time. And there was no crime killing a slave, you know. Secondly, among the non-slave males of, you know, if you exclude the slaves and you exclude the women and you exclude the, you know, children, then you have a certain population, stratum of population left, which is uh, adult males who are not slaves. Now, among them, did they all have the right to vote or were only the rich and privileged people allowed to vote? So if you Ask if you if you ask yourself these questions and you look for the answers. All the answers are available online. You just need to do a Google search 
and search in the right places. Don't search in blogs. Look, look up uh, authoritative texts. Look up texts written by the ancient Greeks themselves. It's all available online. All the translations in English are available online. Look it up. Here's the truth about democracy in Greece. Only wealthy land-owning males who came from certain families were allowed to vote and and stand in elections. That's how it was in Greece. It was a horrifically inegalitarian society, a slave-owning society, a society in which women were second-class citizens. This is the truth. This is the truth. Look it up online. Look up what the Greeks wrote about this matter themselves. So do you call this democracy? I, I, I don't call this a democracy. This is in no shape or form a democracy. Right? Now, the Mahajanapada system was very, very, very ancient. Way It, it existed way before Greece was even you know, a thought in anyone's mind. So it predates Greece by millennia. And we don't quite know the exact system in which voting was done. But first of all, it's way older than Greece. Way, way older than Greece. If, I mean, if you look at your, your Romila Thappers and whoever else, they will say that the Mahajanapadas were about 500 BC. That's what they will say. It's a complete lie. The Mahajanapadas greatly predate Greece. But if you look at the... If you, if you read these books and they say certain things, you have to ask yourself a simple question. When the so-and-so eminent historian makes a statement or a claim in their book. What evidence are they putting in front of you to back up the claim? So when they claim that the Mahajanapada system was 500 dates back to 500 BC, what evidence do they present to back up this opinion? Typically, you will see no opinion, no, no evidence. Or doctored evidence, you know, cherry-picked evidence. So the fact is that, first of all, the Mahajanapada system was very, 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 very ancient. Way it, it is essentially the, the late Vedic age that we're talking about. And uh, I will not go into the chronology of the Vedic age, how old it is, but it clearly is something that was contemporaneous with the uh, Saraswati being in her prime. The Saraswati, the river Saraswati being in her prime. And the Saraswati was last in her prime around at least 6,000 years before today, at least. So that's the... Vedic age or the late Vedic age. So that, that's how ancient the Mahajanapada system is. And we have other pieces of evidence also. Uh, and we don't know exactly what system we had for voting and all, but the uh, system of, of electing your, your rulers and representatives in your local officials is very, very ancient in India. So that itself tells you that democracy is way older in India, democracy was not even a thing in Greece because you had slavery and women were excluded and only wealthy, privileged males from certain families were allowed to vote or stand for election. In the case of India, we never had slavery and women were never second-class citizens. And if you look at the you know, the archaeological evidence from the Saraswati Sindhu region, the Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, Rakhigari, Dola, Vira, Lothal and so many other cities that we have found, you find that all the dwellings are the same. It's a very egalitarian society. There is no evidence of, of inequality. There is no evidence of, of kings and rulers and emperors. So that that itself tells you how egalitarian and, and uh, maybe democratic the society was. So we obviously would need more evidence. from, But all the evidence that we have already tells us that India was way more egalitarian and democratic than Greece ever was. In India, democracy in India way predates even the birth of Greece itself. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's about whether you want to trust people's opinions that yeah or whether you want to do a little bit of hard work and respect yourself and look for the evidence yourself most of us are you know thinking is hard work thinking is really hard most of us just want to be taught what to think and we will happily think that way but if you want to go against the flow and actually discover things from yourself and, and with the understanding that much of what we are told could be not entirely true, then it takes a lot of hard work to go and look for the evidence yourself. Do your own research. Find the sources and the texts that your teachers and the professors won't tell you about, even though it's all available online. It takes some work to do that. And most people, for most people, this doing that work is too hard. It's too difficult. It's, it's much easier to live a comfortable, happy life in which you believe that everything your teachers tell you is right. And that's how it is. Uh, right, 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 right. Okay. 
ओके लेट्स सी सम अदर क्वेश्चंस हार्दिक शर्मा सेस इन द मूवी पैसेंजर्स आई सो दैट अ स्पेसशिप वाज रनिंग थ्रू न्यूक्लियर रिएक्टर इन इट व्हाइल ऑल पैसेंजर्स वर हाइबरनेटिंग व्हाट आर द प्रॉब्लम्स इन डूइंग दैट इन रियल लाइफ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल hibernation humans don't hibernate bears hibernate you go to the himalayas you have these uh, giant bears you have you have, how many species of bears do we have in india at least four or five species we have the the brown bear the, the largest bear no the second largest bear in the world is a brown bear which is found across eurasia even in north america the the brown bear we have that we have the himalayan black bear we have the sloth bear we have a certain species of bear that is found in the eastern part of india the far east or the so called northeast of india So we have at least four species of bears in india and typically the bears that live in cold regions where it gets really cold and, and it freezes over in winter those bears typically hibernate several months a year what that means is that they eat a gen- a huge amount of food in the summer time in the spring time starting from spring time all the way into autumn and then it, as it starts getting clo- cold they find a nice comfortable sheltered place to go and sleep in and then they sleep the entire winter and to to be able to survive the entire winter without eating they put on a huge amount of weight during the preceding months yeah mm-hmm. and by the time winter is over and spring comes out and they come emerge from their cave or whatever it is out of hibernation they are like literally half the weight because the body used up all that extra built up fat um mm-hmm. to sustain itself to keep the energy uh, to to keep the metabolism going yeah fat is a f- wonderful source of energy so to hibernate means hibernation the word hibernation comes from the uh, the french word is hiver which means winter so it's it's related to that so it's about spending the winter in a state of suspended animation not being awake sleep sleep several months four five months to be able to do that you need significant stores of energy fuel in the body now, human beings i mean unless you you so if if a human being were to hibernate you would either have to put on a huge amount of fat first or you would need a system that would you know keep on injecting energy either in the form of glucose or something else into the body so that while you're asleep uh you 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 the body has enough fuel to uh keep the metabolism going properly and normally the second thing is how does one hibernate i think one has to rewire some part of the brain to be able to hibernate because typically human beings sleep 8 hours between 6 to 8 or 6 to 9 hours a day on average i would say mostly it's uh, it's around 8 hours but it's impossible even if you try to sleep let's say 24 hours i think it's extremely hard to sleep that long uh, did did our ancestors hibernate in the past i don't see i don't know if there is any evidence of that but we are mammals after all bears are also mammals there are other animals also that hibernate so it may be possible to you know rewire the brain or, or do something that would induce hibernation in human beings that's, that's number one or secondly you know sometimes you have to medically put people in in artificial comas to give them the the time to recover when they have they are injured or something especially when some people get you know cranial injuries head injuries and the the the, cere- the cerebrum cerebellum what of the brain is kind of slightly damaged slightly swollen it it makes sense to give the person a couple of weeks of rest you know put them in an induced coma so that uh, the the brain gets the time to you know uh, recover so that is you could call it in some sense artificial induced hibernation but it's actually a coma which is done by you know giving certain drugs and, and injecting them into the blood stream so first of all the, the problem is that i i as far as i know there is no way of inducing hibernation in human beings as far as i know the the research is being done ha- has been done and i'm sure it's still being done maybe there could be a breakthrough maybe we are close to a breakthrough maybe we may all already perhaps possibly have the technology i am not aware of it so number one the problem is hibernation the second thing is you know a cryo sleep or whatever you you cool the body down to a significant you know like 10 degrees below normal or whatever then your metabolism really slows down so that is something that could also be done but these are all untested technologies you typically don't want to test them on humans so you will have to experiment with uh, with innocent animals and we know what happens in that that's a different story so the first thing is hibernation is is not something that uh, that is natural to humans and i'm not sure if we can at this point in time induce hibernation safely and bring human bring human beings out of hibernation safely after say a month or 3 months or maybe 10 years or whatever it is the, the journey of the spaceship will last uh nuclear reactor 
spaceships uh, using a nuclear reactor well yeah you can you can certainly use a nuclear reactor on a spaceship either to generate the electricity to sustain to keep all the systems going uh, when it comes to nuclear propulsion it's also possible it's also possible uh, significant amounts of research have been done in the 19 i think 60s 70s perhaps about possibly going to mars using nuclear propulsion essentially nuclear explosions yeah um uh, it's certainly possible but once you're out into space and you've achieved the velocity that you wanted to achieve you don't really need a nuclear uh, propulsion uh, engine going on all the time you achieve your the velocity you want and then you shut off the engines you'll keep going that's newton's third law of motion uh, second law whichever it is you know um uh, third law is action and reaction opposites i think it's the second law of motion we're talking about or the first which one look it up <laughs> so once you achieve your velocity you cannot keep on going with that velocity in the same direction unless you're acted upon by an external force so uh, and i'm sure there are more efficient ways of uh, achieving uh, high velocities one example one one technology is the solar sail technology um, or light sail technology in which you have a large sail light sail very thin sail in which on which you shine enormous enormous amounts of laser light using that you can accelerate a spacecraft to tremendous velocities maybe like 10 20 30% of the speed of light in about half an hour so that's enough so you don't need nuclear propulsion for that once once you have achieved that velocity but it is certainly possible yeah so the problems in real life see first of all nuclear reactors are reasonably safe are actually very safe compared to other things if you if you design it properly you build it properly it's going to be very safe so nuclear reactors are not problematic uh, so that's fine the only issue i see in this entire thing is hibernation i'm not sure it, the it is it is achievable it may be but i'm not i don't i'm pretty sure we still don't have the ability to safely induce hibernation make a person hibernate for certain amount of time and then bring the person out of hibernation safely i don't think it's ever been done so yeah that's that's what i can say okay so mahesh says where was the vedic pe- were the people of the vedic period vegetarian or non vegetarian look india is enormous huge some continent some continent sized uh territory it's a subcontinent it's not a nation state little one enormous so we had an enormous diversity of people and in the vedas we have for instance if you if you see that you know the relevant sections for the ashwamedha yagna you at the end of the ashwamedha yagna you sacrifice the horse yeah you sacrifice him and then you you eat the flesh of the horse ritually ritualistically and there's more to it i'll not go into that right so uh this this was thousands of years ago there seems to be evidence of people eating meat and i'm sure lots of people will get offended as because i'm saying this right now because we try to project what we are today into the past into onto our ancestors you know it may be right or wrong but some people say that the past is a different country it's a different time and different place and the customs may have been very different now we know we have cultural continuity over thousands of years and we know that overall in our culture it is said that being non violent is the highest ideal and which means you should be vegetarian and not cause any unnecessary cruelty but i don't think it was uniformly you know practiced everywhere i am sure there were people maybe a significant percent of the sections of the population that ate meat even lord buddha who was the epitome of non violence and ahimsa it is said that his last meal on the planet earth was a dish made of pork he 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 attained he attained mahaparinirvana in, in the city of kushinagar and we know his mahaparinirvana discourse the last sermon that he gave which is extremely instructive and most people want to kind of forget it because it's very inconvenient uh, but uh, okay that's a different story but yeah his last meal was supposed to be a dish of pork so i think indians have always been in two camps one camp is the vegetarian camp we will not cause any unnecessary cruelty and we will eat only you know uh, plant based food or maybe uh, maybe uh, dairy also and there was always one camp most likely that the the maybe the, the ones who were warriors etc they would need more protein and that's for that's why they had a more tamasic diet so uh so i can't say for sure but there are elements in the vedic texts that do hint at uh, people consuming meat 
So don't hate me for this. This is just what I've seen. And let's not get emotional about these things. We may be a certain way today. It may, doesn't mean that our ancestors were the same way several thousand years ago. Right? Okay. Uh, right. Um, AI. Let's talk about AI in the human brain. Transhumanism. Vikrant says, so your latest episode on TRS. Yes, a very long episode. Wonderful, right? Good fun. I had good fun recording that. So, with Ranveer. Always fun talking to him. A question. Neurologists have already mapped the human brain and thoughts are neurons firing electric signals. Will AI be able to mimic the human brain? Okay, so interesting question. We have mapped the human brain. Uh, neurologists and, and physicians and doctors and anatomists have spent countless hours uh, working on cadavers, which is you know dead human bodies that have been donated for medical science or whatever. Let's not go into how they procure these things. And then you know, even in the case of Albert Einstein, his brain was removed and it was diced up into cubes and they are still being studied apparently. And they still haven't been able to decipher what was so special about him. So listen, that itself is a good example. Doctors have preserved Albert Einstein's brain, one of the greatest scientists in the history of humanity. Nobody disputes that. One of the greatest geniuses of all time. His brain has been preserved. It has been diced up small cubes have been made and scientists have been studying these portions of his brain for decades and they have not been able to decipher or discern or discover what made him special. So we may have mapped the human brain. We know the anatomy of the human brain. We know all the sections. We know what nerves go where. We have the optic nerve that crosses itself behind the eyes. You know, it, it, it crosses itself and it goes like that. So it's not this eye goes in this direction, the nerve, and this the nerve for this eye goes there. The optic nerves cross over here. There's a, there's a conjunction point, and then they go in that direction into the brain. So the eyes actually are an extension of the brain. So we know and we understand the different parts of the brain, and we have a very good idea of how the connections are and what, what processing happens in which section. We also know that neurons fire, and that's how these trillions of connections are formed, and that's maybe what gives rise to the human mind or consciousness and all that yeah and it's still we don't and still we don't understand it we understand next to nothing about the human mind human thoughts uh, we can certainly you know put neuro they put electrodes on the human brain human scalp and uh, figure out the brain activity which portions of the brain are active when you're doing certain activities let's say when you're reading or when you're playing music when you're singing when you're just thinking or when you're sleeping there are different modes of brain activity um, different kinds of waves alpha waves waves beta waves etc we know a lot about the brain and we still know next to nothing about it the best example of that of not knowing understanding the brain is that you have einstein's brain that which is disassembled and chopped up into cubes and we still don't know what made him a genius what what is special about this brain as opposed to the brain of a, a different person we still don't know uh, and there are animals that have much larger brains than human beings much larger brains the elephant's brain is much larger than ours uh, i'm sure many whales have much larger brains than humans. So what makes us different from them? Why are they not way more intelligent than us? Or maybe is it the fact that their bodies are different from ours and that they're confined in the water or whatever that, that gives them, that kind of uh, shackles them? They don't have fingers and the tools to, to modify the world. There are lots of questions. So yeah, it is possible that thoughts are maybe lots of neurons working in tandem, firing signals. You know, the we know how neurons work. The sodium... So, you know, ions and all that. I mean, you can look it up. It's very interesting. So, so that's so we know a lot and we still don't know a lot. That's that's the situation we are in. We still don't understand consciousness at all. Yeah. So we may create, we may be able to create a neural network that mimics the human brain. The, you know, uh, neural networks like GPT-3, etc. are, one could make the claim that they've already passed the Turing test. You can't really tell if it's a human being or a machine on the other, other end that you're talking to. It's We have already reached the, that, that stage. So it can mimic human activity. There is this uh, thought experiment in, in philosophy. It's called philosophical zombies or something. In which the, the thing is that if you have if you have an artificial machine, artificial brain that acts 
just like a human being, you see the same responses. Does it mean it's conscious or is it just pretending? Is it just an imitation machine? Right? So it's it's it, it goes to the root of consciousness, what consciousness is. So I think AI will be able to mimic the human brain. But I don't know if it will ever be conscious the way we are conscious. We may not be able to tell the difference. It will behave exactly the way a human being would behave. And still, we will not know whether it's conscious. When it comes to biological creatures, we know consciousness. We, we recognize it the moment we see it. You see a cat, you know there's consciousness there. That cat is conscious. Each cat is unique. Each cat has a different character, uh, personality. Same with dogs, same with elef elephants, same with horses, same with tigers, same with lions, um, same with whales, etc. So we recognize consciousness when we see it, but we can't define it. So will AI be the same? If you have different AI systems, will they all have their own personalities? You know, distinct personalities. Is, is that something that will emerge? And if it does emerge, does it still mean that, that the system is conscious? So there is a research that has been done by Dr. Subhash Kak, you know, who has been researching this extensively. He says it is never going to be possible for an AI system to be fully conscious the way human beings are conscious. It simply lacks certain things. Uh, I will not elaborate on that right now because it's a very detailed um, uh, piece of research, but you can look up the paper online. So I think AI will be able to mimic human beings. Maybe mimic the human brain. But I don't know if it will ever actually be conscious. But it doesn't mean it could not be dangerous or powerful. Uh, AIs could become super intelligent, way more pa powerful and capable than human beings are. You know, that could happen. But it may still not be conscious. That's the deal. Okay, okay, okay. Where are we now? Let's take some more questions. I... I um, <laughs> Writer World says, what do you think of the internet? Does it have bad effects on humans? Does internet ma Is hum internet making humans less productive and more anxious? Yes, it, it, it all depends on how you use it. For most people, social media is all, it's, social media is designed to hook you in, to draw you in, and to captivate you for hours on end. You keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. No, it, it keeps on giving you this dopamine release every time. Because once it understands what kind of videos you watch or what, what kind of texts or posts you you are interested in it will give you more of the same so it, it's you know they've really figured out human psychology really well that's where the real sociology of the world is happening you know in these corporations they understand sociology and human psychology way better than your your professors do your professors are, are amateurs now by by this point you know they may have written these wonderful books and they may look very distinguished and eminent but it's the real psychology and the real sociology is happening in this big corporation. They have really figured out the human psyche and psychology. And they really know how to hook you in, especially when you are very young. You have kids today who are hooked on to these things, you know, teenagers and even 12 years old and 10 years old kids and all that. And adults as well. And one, and over time you realize you're wasting your time, but you're so hooked to it. And that kind of makes you feel great. It gives you the short-term dopamine release, joy feeling of pleasure while long term making you more anxious and more worried and it it i'm sure people get depressed by this so it's up to you it's your choice you can you know it's it's about it's about having a personal policy it's as simple as that make your own policy of how much time you will spend on the internet especially in social media internet is fine you can use the re internet for doing research for studying for discovering things for a lot of good work it's social media that's the problem. Social media, especially the short, tiny little videos. Yeah, I'm not saying all tiny videos are bad, but typically when you see these reels endlessly, cat videos or, or whatever videos it is, it can be a genuinely big distraction and a drain on your time. So have a policy, formulate a policy. I will spend X amount of time per day on social media. Once that time is done, uh, it's done. I'll not look at it. If you can have that much, that modicum of discipline, you're good. But if you are going to be a slave to, to the algorithms, then you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your life. It's going to make you less productive, way less productive. It's going to make you very sedentary and you're going to get more and more anxious. So that's that's essentially it's your choice. Will you be the master of the devices that you own or will the devices be your masters? Yeah, I think the internet is a wonderful tool. 
the internet has brought humanity together it's it's made it one planet one one society for a change we have very different people but we are all together we all have these common meeting grounds you know social media so it's something that has empowered people i mean for 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 when it, when it comes to india it's brought the people of india together for the first time in a millennium it's given the ordinary man woman and child of india a voice for the first time in a thousand years india india has been suppressed for a thousand years now finally social media has given everybody a voice we can now connect in real time with people across the length and the breadth of india and the entire world so that is empowering that's wonderful but then if you get drawn into it hooked into it and you know you become uh, you you part of the matrix like like the movie you know keanu reeves then yeah it's not going to be good for you so it it has its good points and bad points it's up, it's up to you how you want to use it so as long as you have a clear policy of how you will use the internet you know take a couple of hours take take a day off from the internet and think about how you know we want to use it and write it down these many hours i'll spend on the internet out of which this much time on social media and that's it and you'll be good to go all right um khosro anushirwan says what are your thoughts on darwin's theory being removed from ncert class 10th books uh I I'm I I keep hearing about this I have not really looked into what they have done or not assuming that what the reports are saying is correct and they've removed darwin's theory of evolution from class 10th books well the question is have they put it in class 9th books already or has it been moved to class 11th i don't care at what point in time you teach it as long as you teach it and it's not darwin's theory maybe some people have a issue with this guy darwin it's just evolution and evolution is a thing so if you don't if you are teaching kids biology but you don't want to teach evolution that is problematic so i don't know whether that is the case maybe possibly hypothetically i don't know but maybe they're teaching it at a, at a different point in time then what's wrong with that the education uh, the people in charge of the education system have the the right to make certain choices as to when to to introduce what concepts in in the the syllabus in the curriculum i am sure you can teach dar the the theory of evolution to a 10 year old i am sure you can if you know how to communicate and teach it's not that hard so i don't know what's being done i have not really looked into it um, but if they are if if it is so like some people are claiming that they are completely expunging the curriculum at all levels of the theory of evolution that would be problematic but i'm not sure if, if that is the case i i i am a firm you know i mean i am very pro science i'm a scientist right i believe that a nation can progress only if we embrace science and technology but of course we have to keep it in balance by being rooted in our culture there is no clash between culture and science and technology some people claim it those people are <laughs> i don't know which polite word i could could use for them but yeah some very intelligent people claim that you cannot be culturally grounded while also being scientifically advanced so you have to choose one or the other that is an over simplistic uh take i would say um so i think that uh, you, we have to teach all aspects of science proven science we know that evolution is a thing we see that in the fossil record over millions of years so this has to be taught at what level let let them decide but if it is being completely removed that would be a problem that's what i that's my view okay um Atharva says I am a BA Chinese student interesting I read from Cambridge University books I borrow from the library as there are, there are they are 12000 rupees per book for a series of 18 and I other I read other western books won't they contain biases as they do for India you read any book that's written by western authors or indian authors um you will you will it is inevitable that it will contain a eurocentric or occidentalist bias uh edward said called it orientalism the way they you know they they um they subtly or sometimes overtly disparage eastern cultures and portray them as 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 primitive 
in subtle ways, sometimes overt ways. In the case of China, it's more subtle. In the case of India, it's like complete demonization of everything, everything Indian. Uh, so if you are reading Cambridge University books about China, I can promise you, I can guarantee you, it's going to contain Eurocentric and Occidentalist bias. I think China is a wonderful civilization. It's three, three and a half thousand years old. And India and China have had great relations. I, I, I think China's civilization is wonderful. There's a great amount of beauty and richness in their culture. One, very interesting history as well. And the books that we get to read about China are all written by Westerners. I would like to see a history of China and studies of Chinese culture written by Chinese and translated into maybe, maybe English perhaps, but translated by Chinese into English. Then you will know that this is a proper Chinese perspective because the it is a culture can be represented properly only by people who belong to that culture, not by outsiders who know next to nothing about it. Even if a person has a PhD in Chinese culture and has spent 20 years researching Chinese culture, that person still doesn't know, understand Chinese culture properly or Indian culture for that matter. Outsiders will never understand a, a culture properly. It's only people who are born in that culture that truly understand that culture. So, you know, so so if you're reading Cambridge University books, it's 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 a guarantee that it will contain biases. Now, it's up to you to be alert when you're reading. You can certainly read that. I mean, there are it's a series of 18 books. Wow, that's a big series, yeah. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of in, good information in there. But you have to be mentally alert when you're reading everything. So, yeah, it, it takes time and practice to reach that level of, of maturity and alertness where you can tell when somebody is being biased, you know. And the best way to, 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 uh, the best way to misrepresent a culture in a book is to make sure that 98% of what you write is accurate and there's 2% misinformation in there. Very subtly mixed in. So you really can't tell. And that's the best, you know, that's the most effective way of, of misleading people. 98% of what you write has to be accurate. Just 2% has to be misinformation. And you mix it in very subtly. So you have to be really alert when you read these books. So yes, the short answer is they will certainly contain bias, anti-China bias, as they do for India. <clears throat> okay. What's your thoughts about the Philadelphia experiment, says Abhishek? Is inf involvement of Albert Einstein true? I have seen no evidence of any involvement of Albert Einstein in any experiments. He was a theoretical physicist, a pure theoretical physicist, which means that his laboratory was his brain and the other lab. So all you need to be a theoretical physicist is your brain, your mind, and a pen and paper. That's all you need. And these days you need the internet for research and all that. But that's it. You don't tinker with machines and do stuff and all that. Yeah. So Einstein was a pure theoretical physicist. He, I don't know of him ever doing any experiments apart from thought experiments. He was great at thought experiments, Redankin experiments. So as far as I as I know, I am 99.999% con convinced that Al Albert Einstein has no involvement whatever in this alleged Philadelphia experiment. Uh, and I don't know if it actually happened. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, stories that are out there of people getting embedded in the in the in the walls of a ship and all that well show me the evidence it's not something that happens on a on a routine basis and we don't have the technology to make that happen in case the us government has such technology well that's that's technology that kind of bends the laws of physics as we, as we know them so my thoughts about the philadelphia experiment is that it's most likely i am very strongly almost convinced that it's it's a urban legend or a myth that has been made up by people to sell books or or to get famous or whatever. I don't I don't think it really happened. Yeah, because from everything I understand of science and physics, such things can't happen. Obviously, I can be wrong. We only understand five percent of the universe, so obviously I can be wrong. But from what I know, it's it's something that's most likely just a myth or a legend. And Einstein had no involvement in any experiment as far as I know in his life. He was a pure bred theoretical physicist. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see this. I'm a photographer, says Kunal. Well, while I was out in a wildlife wildlife sanctuary for astrophotography, I saw a UFO and I have caught it on raw files. Okay. I know what I have in my hard drive. I know what I saw. Well, 
put it out in the public domain. I I I've heard of people who have who have witnessed UFOs. I personally I personally don't remember if I have witnessed a UFO. If I had, I would it would, have, it would come to my mind immediately. But I know of people who have witnessed phenomena, aerial phenomena that are not easily explainable, and some of them have taken photographs of that or video. So if you have done this, please put it out in the public domain, not the raw file, but the PNG or whatever, and and put it out on social media, put it out on Twitter, tag me in it, or put it out on Instagram or wherever, tag me. If I can find it, I get uh, I don't know millions of notifications per day, but I will try to look for it. So please do that, and let's let's see how it goes. Let's see what it looks like. Often you will have natural phenomena that appear, like UFOs. There is something called lenticular clouds that look like flying saucers. I'm not saying I'm not claiming that what you have seen may or may not be this or that. I'm just saying that often you will find natural phenomena that look very suspicious. Uh, you also have these Starlink satellites these days that look very strange to a person who's not aware of the presence of Starlink satellites in the sky. This entire line of satellites that are going by at, at a reasonably leisurely pace across the sky. So if you are aware of Starlink, it will be no nothing new to you, but otherwise it, it's going to be very, you know, uh, disconcerting. So I would say that, you know, if you have this on your, on your, hard drive please process it please make a png or whatever out of it jpg whatever works for you and put it out on social media and let's take a look all right okay uh, all right let's go uh, arihant veer singh yadav says what are my views on the chinese president mr xi jinping's upcoming visit to india in the coming months can the relations improve i said that india and china relations are can only improve from where they are right now. I mean, we are not at war, but we have significant tensions along the uh, undemarcated boundary between India and Tibet. The Chinese occupy Tibet and they are trying to encroach into Indian territory. India is now building infrastructure at, at breakneck speed along the border. The Border Roads Organization, BRO, you go to Ladakh, it's, it's, you'll see these bro signs everywhere. Bro, 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 bro welcomes you. I'm like, who is bro? Unless you know. <laughs> so India is building infrastructure at a tremendous pace. Uh, railways, roads mostly, bridges, etc. And that has disconcerted China because now India's infrastructure is, is, is coming up to where it should be. Airstrips, landing strips, much more. So, um, so that's the, been the cause of tensions. And that's why the Chinese have, have been trying to provoke India. So I think the relations between India and China can only improve from where they are right now. The Chinese will not try to start a war with India because it can escalate in any unforeseen direction. And when you have two nuclear power, nuclear armed nations, you don't want to go to war. And you don't want to risk the chance of a escalation. escalation. So I think that India and China relations can only go upwards from, now, from where they are today. It's good to know that Mr. Xi is coming to India, what exactly is the event? I'm not sure. Is it, is it the is it the G20 thing? Is it the SCO thing? Is it the BRICS thing? I think BRICS is in, in South Africa. Something is coming up. And it's good that he's coming to India. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of potential for India and China and also Russia in, in terms of cooperation. If we can find a proper negotiated and fair solution to the border issue, which will need some give and take from both sides for sure. If we can do that, if we can achieve that, then there will be no more tensions, hopefully, along the border, which will be fully demarcated. And then India and China's relationship can actually, cautiously, one could say, improve significantly, especially when one puts Russia into the mix. See, right now what we are seeing is a bifurcation of the global world order. For 500 years, we have had the Anglo-Saxon hegemony over the world, more or less. They have been ruling the world. They have been dictating terms, the so-called rules-based world order, which was based on their whims and fancies. It's been an extremely exploitative system that has uh, served to strengthen and enrich them at the expense of the rest of the world. And we may not, not see it that way, but do you understand how much the Indian rupee has devalued since 1947? There was a time when one rupee was roughly equal to one dollar. What is it now? 80. Imagine India's rupee is even at 10, 10 rupees to a dollar. India's GDP would be eight times what it is today. 
so i think it is it is a good thing that the world order is 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 realigning significantly and it can happen only if the three large great powers can cooperate india and russia and china and if if one is out of this mix it's going to be it's not going to work if they really want to create a new and more fair and equitable world order and to finally put an end to the anglo saxon hegemony over the world for that these three great powers have no option but to work together so i think the the weakest link in this grouping in brics is china because of their hegemonic and expansionist and imperialistic policies and i i think it's time for china to wake up and smell the coffee of of how things are going it's very clear now that this is going to be the indian century most indians will not agree with me because they see look around and they see oh kuch nahi ho raha hai wait 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 until 2030 and see where india is so the chinese are not stupid they they will know how things are going and in what direction the world is going they will obviously keep on working to to towards making their nation more powerful why not they have the right to do it i have nothing against that but it cannot come at the expense of india that's something they have to understand and that's what the indian government has i think proved has has done more than enough to demonstrate to china that it's it's not going to work for you if you try to mess with india so i think there has to be some kind of compromise or some kind of solution to this the ideal situation is we demarcate the boundary in a fair just equitable manner with some give and take possibly on both sides yeah if you do that then things will be better and then india and china and russia can work together to really create a proper good just fair equitable system that is apart from the anglo saxon hegemonic system that we have experienced with the past 500 years and because we have lived under this under the system for 500 years we don't see anything wrong with it most of us mm-hmm. if you unless you go deep into it and see what they are doing you know to exploit everybody else so i think it's a very good sign that mr shi is coming to india obviously it, it, he will be in consultations with prime minister modi and other leaders but it's mainly about india and china from my perspective uh, the relations need to improve it's going to be good for india as well as, as as for china and for much of the global south the so called global south which is africa and east asia and southeast asia and to some extent latin america yeah. that's the global south the nations that have been ba- that have been groaning under the the heavy boot of colonialism for almost 5 centuries half a millennium it's high time we end this nonsense so that can only happen if ric happens and it's still a fair way away you know it's still a little early to start talking about that so mr modi and mr shi need to get together work things out i think mr shi understands this so it's a good thing he's coming and i i am hopeful i am hopeful i am hopeful that uh, things will improve between india and china it will be good for both nations and for the peoples of both countries om says is it possible to make nuclear powered c130j like aircraft let's let's look at the c130j what does the c130j look like c130j it's a heavy lift transport aircraft not heavy lift medium lift uh, let's put that on the screen So this is what the Google image search tells us. Here it is. That's what it looks like. It's a reasonably large aircraft, as you can see. We can see it with people. There you have it. It's an American-built aircraft, and uh, the Indian Air Force uh, operates many of these Super Hercules aircraft. It's a reasonably large aircraft. There are larger, there are bigger ones as well. Aircraft that are bigger than this one, and it's a it's an old actually it's it's an aircraft that's been in service for a very long time for decades. So, so that's the size that we're talking about. Can you have an aircraft like that powered by nuclear propulsion? Well, we already have nuclear powered cruise missiles. The Russians have a nuclear powered cruise missile which can essentially loiter around the Earth for indefinitely, days, possibly weeks. so if you can use the same kind of propulsion in this aircraft l- let's say let's see this this aircraft is a, has turbo prop engines propellers as you can see uh, as you can see this propellers over here so you take this aircraft and you replace the four propellers with let's say two nuclear uh, propulsion systems or maybe four nuclear propulsion systems or maybe even one i don't know depending on the on the strength power of that it can certainly work the question is how safe is it planes can crash 
And if you have a nuclear reactor or four nuclear reactors on your plane, when your plane crashes, it's going to be an environmental catastrophe. When it comes to cruise missiles, they're anyway de designed to crash and, and be destroyed. When it comes to planes, you don't ever want them to crash. But unfortunately, sometimes accidents happen. They happen, they happen from time to time. So that's the reason why I think the Americans have tried this in the 1960s or something, 50s, 60s, 70s, somewhere around that time, nuclear propulsion, nuclear reactor on an aircraft. I think it certainly can work. So you can have a miniaturized nuclear uh, reactor, which can possibly run a turboprop engine, the way possibly like what you have in submarines, that also has this, uh, you know, propeller at the end helical propeller, or you can have nuclear power propulsion, nuclear scramjet or ramjet, for instance, in which instead of fuel, it is a nuclear reaction that that uh, that uh, raises the temperature of the air to the extent that where you have the, the ramjet uh, effect or, sc or scramjet effect. So you can have nuclear powered ramjets, which would, which would make this a hypersonic plane, actually, you know, supersonic plane. Uh, so it's possible. But it's dangerous because planes do crash from time to time. One never wants them to crash, but they do crash. And if a plane crashes with a nuclear reactor on board, it's going to be an env environmental disaster. So that's why nobody has done this. Also, nuclear reactors are heavy. And fossil fuel engines are much lighter. So that's the reason why it's never been done. But it's certainly possible. <clears throat> right. Okay. What do we have? What do we have? What else? What else? Um, Sanjeev says, if India can't opt for a one-child policy like China, what can be some alternatives to control such a drastic blast of population? So uh, there's an interesting question. So India's population has now surpassed that of China. India's population is 1.4 billion or, or 140 crores, like we say in Sanskrit or, or Hindi, 140 crores. Now, ideally, we have to ask ourselves, what is the ideal size of the population? of the Indian subcontinent. We're talking about the Indian subcontinent here, which includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, all of that. Let's talk about all of that. Maldives. What's the ideal size of the Indian subcontinent's population? Well, around the beginning of the 20th century, let's say around 1930, 1940, what was the population? It was about 330 million. 33 crores. Right? Today it is 140 crores. So I think ideally the population of India, the Indian subcontinent, should be between 300 to 350 million. And we are way past that. So obviously when you have like four times, roughly four times the population, when you have roughly four times the ideal population, there's going to be a huge burden on the resources of the subcontinent, on the soil, on, on, on the natural resources. So you will have four times the ideal amount of people competing for the same resources. It's going to place a huge burden on the systems, on the infrastructure, and on the resources. It's going to cause uh, deforestation. It's going to cause the soil quality to, to, to deteriorate. It's going to cause extinction of species, unfortunately. it's It has all these terrible effects. So ideally, you want the population of India to gradually, slowly, sustainably shrink over an extended period of time to around 350 million or so. That, I would say, should happen over the next two or three centuries, not over the next 50 years, which would be a total disaster. Why will it be a disaster? Because when you shut down the birth rate, the total fertility rate for a sustained population of the same, same population is 2.1 children per woman. That's the TFR, total fertility rate, for sustaining the population at the current level. If you want the population to start dropping, it should be, the TFR should be below 2.1. Right now, India's TFR is 2.0. So we are already below sustainable, uh, be, be, below sustainable population. So India's population will slowly decline. China's TFR is around 1% is around 1.1, which is a catastrophe. And when your population starts declining and the birth rate decreases, you know what happens? The average age of the population starts rising. And soon China's population by 2050 is going to be, the average age will be 57 or 58. When your average human being is 58 years old, 
what vitality will your nation have ask yourselves this if you opt for a one child policy in 30 40 50 years that's that's a situation where you're going to encounter and there's almost no coming back from there even if china forces its population to have a three child policy it is still not going to make much of an impact now for the next 100 years or so that's the conundrum they have put themselves in so the alternative for india i agree that the population needs to come down the ideal population should be between 300 to 350 million which is almost one fourth of where we are today one fourth yeah one quarter you to to come down to that level you have to do it in a very gradual slow steady calibrated and intelligent manner otherwise your average age is going to your average age is, is going to rise and you're going to have a nation of old people and such a nation can't survive for the long term so ideally i would say this this should happen over the next two centuries at least a century even a century is too much is too little i would say it should be over the next two centuries by 2200 ideally india's population should be around 350 or 400 million or maybe 300 million even that may be a little little too drastic perhaps maybe three centuries so there is no short term solution to this short short term solutions are never good so that's the alternative i can think of it has to be done in a very intelligent calibrated and very gradual manner ideally the average age of your population should be below 40 should be below 40 so by 2050 india's average age is going to be about 37 or 38 ideally you want it to be in in the early 30s or even late 20s that's that's a strong vital young population that's how how you want to be you don't want everyone to to be old so that's uh, that's what i would say should happen a one, ch- one child policy is is terrible maybe a two child policy for a start maybe a two ch- two child policy and i'm sure there'll be lots of protests if we do that but well <laughs> okay uh they just says is the sphinx older than the pyramids how can that be let's let's look at the sphinx sphinx the sphinx is this uh, figure right this lion human figure uh the sphinx let's put it on the screen it's this uh it's it's a lion with the face of a human being it's uh and no one really knows what its age is if you look at it you can see that it has suffered enormous amount enormous amounts of erosion the sands of time have eroded the structure away look at the face it's damaged it's not damaged because of erosion it's d- damaged because of napoleon's troops who used the, the sphinx face for target practice for their cannons that's why the face is damaged but if you look at this you can see if you look at the body of the sphinx you can see the kind of erosion you see on you know or uh, the kind of geological erosion you see on the on mountain sides for instance in the western ghats in india which are some of the oldest mountains in the world so clearly this is a very ancient structure and uh some people would say that you should should carbon date the sphinx you can't carbon date minerals you can't carbon date rocks you can only carbon date organic material and this is pure rock so you can't carbon date it and so that's why nobody really knows how old it is so most historians and egyptologists uh, i think they claim it's uh, about as old as the pyramids but i would say that the pyramids even though they have been significantly damaged you can see all the all the outer cladding has been removed yeah only the top portion is there so even though the py- pyramids have been uh, significantly damaged over the past few two millennia they still seem to be in better shape than the sphinx so i think the sphinx could be way way older than the pyramids maybe 5000 years old maybe who knows how much older i don't know because i don't have any data uh, maybe this is how it looked uh, in the old days the pyramids looked very different in the old days they were very smooth and shiny and and pretty now they are all ruined so i think it's possible that the sphinx may be way older than the pyramids maybe thousands of years older than the pyramids but we don't know for sure we don't know all right yeah i i'm aditya says what happened to queen samyukta after the death of prithviraj chauhan it is debated debated whether she committed johar was or was abducted by ghori i don't quite know you know historical records are very sketchy and very scarce mm-hmm. and so my my answer is i don't know i don't really know what happened uh the best case scenario is that she committed johar 
you understand how how horrible the situation it was those days the best case scenario is that she committed johar and that was it so i i don't really know <clears throat> okay uh it was a lion face of the sphinx yes it was a lion face of the sphinx Surya GitHub says, your views on the Poonch attack and what should India do? Yes, recently we had this condemnable and unacceptable terrorist action in which uh, an Indian army convoy was attacked, a vehicle was attacked, and, and some um, a number of Indian uh, armed forces personnel lost their lives. It is condemnable, it is unacceptable, and whoever has done this will be brought to justice. Now, what should India do about this? Um, yeah, see... One, what are the options that we have? One option is we teach the Pakistanis another big lesson, disproportionate retaliation. Mm -hmm. So you killed five of our guys, we're going to kill 10 times you guys, your terrorists. Terrorists, not civilians. Terrorists and combatants, which means uh, army, uh, military personnel. That's one option. So it could be either in the form of a surgical strike or a airstrike. But now the Pakistanis know about this, that India could do this. Mm -hmm. So what should India do? You know, there's only the the best way to respond to this is to ensure that in the next three to five years, Pakistan is a thing of the past. That's what India has to do. Pakistan is teetering on the brink of economic collapse. It's being propped up by its, its overlords, the Western powers, the IMF, the World Bank, essentially the US. Um, so the I would say that the best way to respond to this is to ensure that we engineer the peaceful uh, balkanization of Pakistan within the next three to five years. Even 10 years is too much now. And once again, let me reiterate, I have nothing against the people of Pakistan. The I have nothing against the ordinary man, woman and child in Pakistan. Nothing at all. They are our own people. They're the same blood, the same past. But of course, they hate us today, which is a whole different story. Most of them, I'm not sure. I don't think everyone hates us in India. Indians, I don't think every Pakistani hates India or Indians, but most of them we know they do. But I have nothing against them. So it should happen ideally, peacefully, without any shots fired. So that's what India should do ideally. But if it's not achievable peacefully, we can look at other solutions with minimum damage. But, uh, you know, Pakistan has been bleeding India with US support for decades. I don't think the most ardent Pakistani fan can deny this or the most ardent U.S. fan can deny this. The Americans have funded and financed Pakistani terrorism in India for several decades. It stopped at some point in time, after 2008, I believe. But we don't know what the situation is now. They they supported Al-Qaeda, they supported Osama bin Laden, they supported Saddam Hussein, they supported lots of such people. You read the book, which is called Black Flags, it will tell you that the Americans even created ISIS. Uh, so Pakistan is a proxy which is designed to keep India off balance. Now India has become too big for Pakistan to keep us off balance. So um, so ideally, and, and, and you know, Pakistan was created out of Indian territory without ever consulting the people of India. It was a bunch of politicians who were appointed by the British who, make the, who made this decision. It was actually a British deci decision to balkanize India, to break India up. So uh, it is Indian territory. It is a territory of our ancestors. It was taken away from us without our consent. And in the long term, we will get it back. Nobody can stop this. But right now, Pakistan needs to be balkanized. The, the, the just aspirations for freedom of the people of Balochistan, of the people of Sindh, of the people of Khaybar Pakhtunwa, of the people of Gilgit Baltistan and Pakistan Occupied Kashmir, they need to, you know, these aspirations need to be met. Sindh should get its, get its freedom. Balochistan should get its freedom. Khaybar Pakhtunwa should be allowed to reintegrate itself with Afghanistan. Gilgit, Baltistan and POK need to come back to India. Punjabistan can stay whatever it is. That's fine. So that's what needs to happen, you know, in the next three to five years. Ideally, ideally three years. I'm sure it can be done. We are reaching that stage now. So I think instead of retaliating to individual attacks, this is what India should focus on right now. That's what I think should happen. Okay. Uh, Ujwal says, please talk about current relations between India and Israel. Um, see, we have to understand what Israel is. Uh, let's go to the screen because we are talking about another nation. So we need to uh, 
I'm sure most of us know where Israel is, but just in case some of us don't, I'm going to put that on the map because, uh, as you know, I love the map. Where is the map? Here is the map. So Israel, we know where India is, go westwards. We move through the temporary nation, then Afghanistan, then Persia. And then we move into the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Jordan. And then we have Israel, Israel over here, which is west of Jordan, north of Egypt and the Sinai region. So this is Israel. So relations. So Israel is is an outlier in the Middle East. It's it's maybe the only non-Muslim nation there today. Uh, Lebanon used to be a Christian nation, but it is not so anymore because of uh, demographic reengineering, which happened in the second half of the twentieth century. So Israel is a Jewish nation, mostly Jewish. The majority is Jewish. It's an outlier in the Middle East because all other nations are Islamic nations, Muslim nations, uh, including Turkey, which is like some of it is in, in Europe. And um, Israel has survived lots of lots of uh, very hairy situations, no, multiple wars. And it's a, it has survived because it has, see, first of all, the people of Israel are very re- resilient. They are, they are uh, very resourceful, etc. But it would not have survived without the uh, support of the United States. So you could consider Israel to be essentially, in some ways, a proxy of the U.S. in the Middle East region. Uh, Now, the relationship between India and much of the Middle East is excellent today. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, India-Saudi Arabia relations are excellent. Excellent today. India-UAE relations are excellent. India-Oman relations are excellent. You know, it's, it's very surprising, but it's the case. India has extremely good relations with these nations. When it comes to Iran also, we have a very good understanding with them. And now what we are seeing is that the nations, these nations are now uh, creating, I mean, they they are now uh, normalizing, so to say, to some extent, their relationship with Israel. So historically, it's been a very antagonistic relationship, but now many of them are establishing diplomatic relations. They are giving Israel or flight uh, flight, relations rights and much more. So it's a good thing overall. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we had Velina Chakarova on on my podcast and she made a very interesting observation. Uh, She said that the US influence in the Middle East is declining and the Middle East is stabilizing. She, I think she made two separate statements, but one can certainly connect them together that the Middle East is now stabilizing significantly while at the same time U.S. influence is decreasing. It is clearly, in this case, a case of cause and effect. It was the U.S. influence in the Middle East that was creating these horrible crises. The Middle East was always in in crisis. And now that the U.S. influence is declining, the Middle East is stabilizing and the nations are, you know, making up with each other. I mean, the Saudis and the Iranians have re-established diplomatic relations, which is a huge step forward and so on. So India and Israel, for the longest time, we had a covert relationship, not an overt relationship. I don't think India even recognized Israel as as an an established diplomatic relations until sometime in the 90s. And the first time an Indian leader visited Israel was in the 2010s when Mr. Modi made his first trip to Israel. But overall, India and Israel have a lot in common, not culturally, but geopolitically. Our interests align to a significant extent. India wants peace in the Middle East. India wants excellent relations with all the nations in the Middle East, especially those that matter. Israel certainly matters. So I think India and Israel have an excellent relationship. Uh, The relationship has really taken off after the uh, uh, advent of Mr. Modi as the Prime Minister of India. And Mr. Modi has shares an excellent relationship with with Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. Mr. The Israeli political system is very uh, unstable. Governments come and fall. You have coalitions, and uh, right now there is you know this weird, not weird but expected uh, <laughs> activity happening in Israel. Mr. Netanyahu was trying to reform the judicial system and make it more pro-people and more in the control of the people. And as expected, you know, there was almost like a like a color revolution situation that happened overnight out of thin air. And I, I, I don't think it's very hard to see where it came from, who was, in, who was trying to engineer that. So I think we should support Mr. Netanyahu. India, India and Israel, if we work together, there's a lot we can achieve together. Uh, so 
the relations between india and israel overall are are excellent and even if uh, some other prime minister comes into the picture in 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 israel the relations will still remain excellent because it's a logic of strategy india and israel have a lot uh, the national the national interests converge and align to a significant interests uh, to, to a significant extent culturally we are very different india and israel have almost nothing in common when it comes to culture but that doesn't matter it's the it's the alignment and convergence of interests geopolitically that really matters in the in the in the in the context of the relationship between the two nations okay jitendra says my fir- my top 5 world war movies my top 5 world war movies um i can think of a movie made in the 1960s or something called the longest day there was a good movie lots of uh, prominent actors from the time i can think of saving private ryan which was a very graphic portrayal of the of the normandy invasion the d day beaches of normandy it starts starts with you, it starts by putting you in media race in middle of the action the first scene itself you know landing on the beaches so um, saving private ryan was good i've seen so many escape to victory or whatever it's about uh, uh, escape to victory escape to freedom i forget the name it was uh, once again uh, an ensemble cast uh, what else i've seen so many of these movies second world war movies i cannot even remember all of them first world war i i i saw a soviet movie a harrowing soviet movie i think it was from the second world war i forget the name of the movie it was a movie from the 1980s it was like really harrowing you never want to see war if you see that movie um what else what else yeah i can't remember the names i typically am very bad with remembering names and all that uh but yeah all quiet along the western front is a new movie that's come out i hear it's good uh i saw dunkirk which i didn't quite like because it kind of tried to whitewash the the contribution of indians but stylistically etc it was a good movie gripping movie um and and i'm sure there are more yeah so anyway good question good question interesting question i i actually am a big fan of movies i like watching movies and these days we don't have any good movies yeah new movies uh <clears throat> okay what else ubendran says how would the world's countries react if we suddenly change our education system and teach our children real history the way it should be taught well i would say most of the world would be indifferent or they would welcome it i am talking about the global south will anybody in africa have an issue with that nobody in africa will have an issue with that will anybody in eastern asia have an issue with that the chinese will actually say good southeast asian countries like vietnam laos cambodia Indonesia and so on they will also welcome it the koreas will welcome it the japanese will welcome it the russians will welcome it the nations in south america will also say good who cares so which nations will have an issue with this it's the nations that are part of the anglosphere or under the hegemony of the anglosphere i'm talking about the eu nations the nato nations and the us and the five eyes five eyes alliance they will have an issue with this and they are maybe 5 or 10% of the world's population so overwhelmingly the world won't care or will be positively inclined will will have a positive reaction it is these little this little bunch of nations which are which have which essentially have all the power in the world they will have an issue with this they want india to remain mentally colonized they want indians to grow up feeling their culture is is inferior to to the western culture they want indians to feel to grow up feeling ashamed of their culture and their heritage so india is still colonized because of the education system so if we change the education system it is the english speaking countries and their minions who will have an issue with this nobody else and it will be their agents within india who have, who will protest so we have the entire education system is is essentially you know especially when it comes to the humanities is filled with these individuals the so called eminent professors etc who have been carrying the white man's burden and there's a term for that and some people allege it's racist i can't be racist against my own people so these people are brown coolies the ones who are carrying the white man's burden and furthering the white man's agenda and i have nothing against the white man also the russians are also white i have nothing against them it's 
it's not really the white man's burden it's the anglo saxon man's burden that they are carrying uh so yeah that's what i think most of the world will be either indifferent or will have a positive reaction to this it's only the 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 colonialists who are still actively colonizing the world who will uh protest and react negatively okay aditya says recently spacex conducted a launch of a mega rocket starship but it failed because of engine failure is isro also working on such mega projects um so it was not really a failure the, the starship is the biggest uh, and most powerful rocket the spa- that spacex has ever built and it's the most powerful rocket the, the world has ever seen it's more powerful than uh, the space launch system sls of of uh, nasa uh, and it's also more powerful than the uh, saturn 5 rocket that werner von braun built for the americans uh in the 96s which took the first people to the moon neil armstrong buzz aldrin and all that <clears throat> so this starship rocket see when you are testing a rocket there are multiple phases of tests the only objective of this test was to see whether this rocket the entire assembled rocket fully assembled rocket can lift off and clear the launching pad if it did that it was a success that's the only thing that's what elon musk very clearly said said weeks before the launch that we will consider this a success if it takes off and clears the launching pad it went about 13 kilometers into the air so it was a, a proper success it was not a failure of course it 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 uh, they eventually uh blew it up it was uh, an uh, they they decided to exp- to to blow it up so that it doesn't end up uh, somewhere it should not be so they they remotely detonated the rocket it's called a rapid unscheduled disassembly <laughs> which is a rather humorous term for uh, an intentional explo- you know uh, destruction of a rocket so when when it was uh, when it was going up into the air while it was climbing you could see it has i think it had 33 raptor engines out of which not all 33 were were, were ignited some of them had gone off so yeah that was something that they'll need to work on so the system can clearly take off on its or take take off properly and go and launch itself into the air it it flew 13 kilometers into the air even without even after some of the rocket engines failed so overall it was a great great success and that's how you create that's how you test out a new system there are multiple tests your first test will not succeed entirely even if your first test fails completely it gives you a huge amount of data which tells you what you need to improve so in india we have so such small budgets that we hope that every test we can only test the rocket once and every test has to be a success full success that's not how it's done ideally ideally you have the budget to conduct multiple rapid tests so you launch the system today it succeeds let's say to a certain extent and the other part fails and whatever fails you get the data back from the sensors and all that then you understand what went wrong you implement the changes and within a month or two you test it again then let's say some things some more things work but some things still fail so you keep on testing you have to keep testing rapidly not once in 10 years not once in 5 years not or not once a year you have to test 10 or 20 times in a year that's how you perfect a system very rapidly for that you need budget a big budget so i don't think it's a failure i think it's a success it's a success because they they were able to validate certain technologies the ones they really wanted to validate the other ones they will perfect later on so the next launch is coming up within 2 months and that launch w- will most likely be more successful than, the, than this one maybe it will attain orbit maybe they will not have to blow it up or even if they have to blow it up they will be most likely able to go way beyond the 13 kilometers altitude that this rocket was able to achieve so yeah that's how it's done now is isro working on such mega projects i think isro is working on a next generation rocket system uh which will be modular in 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 uh, in its uh design but i'm not sure what the uh, status is uh the the most powerful rocket that isro has is the gslv mark 3 or the sls3 i don't know what they call it these days the 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 most powerful gslv they have uh, renamed it to something else these days uh, it's it's a, it's the most powerful rocket that india has 
but in in comparison with the other rockets that the world has for instance the ariane system the chinese long march system the rockets the russian soyuz uh, and other rockets and the american rockets uh, you, when you compare G, the gsv gslv mark 3 with the other rockets you will find that it's a it's a medium launch vehicle a, a light to medium launch vehicle it's not a heavy launch vehicle in india isro has the technology and the understanding and the ability and the talent to build a rocket that's at least 10 times more powerful for that it will need the approval from the government and the funding to do, do this and once again they'll be expected to have success on the first try itself because the funding will be so limited that's the problem with the indian space program it's it's a lack of funding and a lack of i don't know uh, i don't know maybe the indian leadership doesn't see the space as something uh, as as a that's worthy of of being prioritized right now perhaps they are right i don't know obviously they know things m- much better than me they know things about the world that i am not able to see they have information and data and, and, and insights that we common people do not have obviously so maybe they are right from from in what they are doing but the thing is if we if we increase the budget of isro let's say 10 times it's not a huge amount let's say you increase it 10 times ideally then imagine what isro will be able to do within 2 to 3 years it will have a rocket that's easily 10 times more powerful than the gslv mark 3 so i don't know if isro is working on such projects we i mean i do know that uh, such a more powerful rocket is being planned i don't know what the status is what what is it in the conceptual stage is it in the fabrication stage uh, are we anywhere close to uh, close to testing it i have no idea because no such information has been released uh in the future let me see if i can talk to somebody from isro and and find out what's actually happening but right now we don't know All right. Shaheen Wahman Zadegan says, "Is it true that ancient India, China, and Persia were the three super civilizations and superpowers of ancient Asia?" Uh, it depends on which time frame we are looking at. See, when we are taking a photograph, it, we have different lenses. We have a camera body, which costs X amount of money, and then we have an, uh, an assortment of lenses. So, if you want to. take a, a picture at a very you know of a very small let's say you want to picture photograph an ant you take a certain lens certain lenses won't work for that it depends on the focal length let's say if you want a wide angle view then you will have to need uh, use a you know a certain kind of focal length and all that and if you want to do to look at something very far away you need to do it, to use a different kind of length a uh, different kind of lens so there are there's a wide variety of lenses for different purposes there are telephoto lenses there are very very uh, shallow depth of field lenses and so on similarly when you are studying the history of a nation or a civilization it all you will the, the kind of image you get the image you get the understanding you get depends on the lens that you use what do i mean by lens the time frame are you looking at a nation from a 100 year window only the past 100 years then you will get a certain perspective as children we see india as what it is today and that's why we tend to blame our own people for 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 whatever india what whatever is wrong with india if you take a thousand year lens then you will see what was done to india if you look at if you read the right sources from the right sources then you will see a different perspective if you if you take a 2000 year lens and you examine the history of the past 2000 years it gives you a whole different perspective let's say you take a 5000 year lens then it gives you a whole different context so the question is when we when it comes to india china persia what lens are we going to use ideally you want the longest lens possible for china you need a lens that is 3000 years old you need a time frame of 3000 years so you need a reasonably long lens for that 3000 years or maybe 3 and a half thousand years when it comes to persia once again 3 or 3 and a half thousand years I mean, the oldest dynasty that we know of, the Hakshamanish dynasty, the Achaemenid dynasty, is about it. Its its origin is about around around one thousand BC or slightly after that, maybe nine hundred BC or so, or eight hundred BC, somewhere around in in that uh, time period. That's when Hakshamanish, the progenitor, the the founder of the dynasty, is said to have lived and reigned. But the history of the people of Persia is older. the people of persia are essentially migrants from india right uh, and before zoroastrianism we all know what the culture and religion of persia was it was nothing but uh, their form of vedic hinduism or post vedic hinduism um so 
Persia is a daughter civilization of India. So if we take a 3000 year lens hmm, of, of world history, then you had three great civilizations, India, China, Persia. And China was confined to the east. It is not today's China. See, let's let's take a look at the map, right? It's, in, it's important to understand this. When it comes to China, the geographical extent of China was, was eastern China. It was not Tibet. It was not Xinjiang, East Turkestan. It was not Inner Mongolia. It was not uh, Yunnan. It was not Manchuria. It was only the eastern part of China, the Beijing, Shanghai region, maybe Chongqing. Uh, you know, the, the heavy, dense network that you see here, roads, that is that too is much larger than ancient China. So ancient China was the Han region was in the east. So it was nowhere close to the size of the Indian subcontinent. And it was most likely perhaps smaller than present-day Iran. That was ancient China. So it was not a super civilization. It was a civilization, a respectable civilization. And they had conquests and wars. Most of the great wars that the Chinese fought were amongst each other, among themselves. Whenever a foreigner actually invaded China and 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 brought war to Chinese territory, the Chinese typically lost. Uh, that's a different story. So if we take a 3,000 year lens, you had three civilizations, India, China, and Persia. Persia was coming into its full might and glory. India was the oldest civilization, at least 10,000 years old. And India spanned the entire Indian subcontinent, including Gandhara, which is present day Afghanistan. And there were Indianized kingdoms all across Central Asia, including present day Tibet and present day so-called Xinjiang of China. So much of Central Asia was Indianized at the time. Iran itself was an Indianized civilization, which later uh, acquired its own characteristics via Zoroastrianism. Uh, so when it comes to super civilizations, I think when it comes to from, from, the, from the perspective of antiquity, as well as from the perspective of geographical extent, India was a super civilization. Persia was not that large geographically, neither was China. Uh, and India and, and Persia were very closely uh, related culturally, ethnically, genetically, linguistically also. And if you look at the history of Persia of, of uh, before the, the Arabic Islamic invasion of Persia, the entire 1500 or so year history of Persia, they always waged war northwards or westwards. They never ever, even once in recorded history, tried to fight India or invade India. That tells you a story of the relationship between India and Persia. So there were three great civilizations, yes, but the super civilization, whether you agree or not, was India. And if we go back with an even longer lens, 5,000 year lens, there wasn't any China, there wasn't any Persia. It was just India. You go back 10,000 years, we still had India. So yeah, interesting. Okay. Jinnit Shah says Hindu, te Hindu temples older than the Chola period are found in Cambodia. Yes. When did Hindus reach these lands first? Once again, we go back to the map. There are temples all across all across Southeast Asia, all, all the way in Indonesia, across uh, Southeast Asia, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, and you have Indian influence all the way into, into Korea and Japan. So it is true, 100% sure, true, that there are Hindu temples that are found in Cambodia that, that predate the Chola invasion of uh, Southeast Asia, the Chola conquest of Southeast Asia. The Chola conquest of Southeast Asia happened a thousand years before today. It was all the way up to the Philippines. But this region was Indianized way before the Cholas ever mm -hmm. appeared here. So how was this? How did that happen? So you had something called the Funan Kingdom in Vietnam that dates back to at least, I think, roughly 2000 years before today. The founder of the Funan Kingdom was a, a, a local queen who married an Indian merchant. So the, so the founders of the Funan Kingdom were, were an Indian king who was married to a local uh, uh, lady from, from this region. And uh, so the first Indian influence in Southeast Asia, it dates back to, I would say, at least 3000 years before today. And it all came from Kalinga. 
So we have this very ancient tradition in Odisha, which was then called Kalinga, of trading with Suvarna Bhumi and beyond. Suvarna Bhumi is Thailand. And beyond is Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, Philippines and Indonesia. So it is initially the, the people of Kalinga who established you know, very strong trade and cultural relations with the lands of Eastern Asia, especially Southeast Asia. And it is they who brought in Indian culture first. So you find uh, ancient temples in Southeast Asia, all across Southeast Asia, whether it's Myanmar or Thailand or Cambodia or Vietnam or Laos or anywhere else. These temples date back to 2000 or even more years before today. And nations have even gone to war over temples. There is something called the Priya Vihar Temple, which lies at the, at the, at the, at the border of Thailand and Cambodia. Let me Let me show that. The Priya Vihar Temple. Let me Google that and put that on the screen. Okay, where is it? Yeah, here we are. The Priya Vihar Temple. This is a temple that's on the exact border of Thailand and Cambodia. And in the early 2000s, the two nations almost went to war over this temple. Both these nations claimed this, this sacred temple. It's in ruins. It's very ancient. It's I don't know how old it is. Close to 2000 years old, I'm sure. Maybe more than that. It's in ruins. It's a Hindu Sh Shiva temple. And the two nations went to war over a ruined temple. Nearly went to war. They had to go to the UN, I think, to resolve the dispute. It was a very serious dispute. The Priya, Priya Vihar temple. And there was a, if, you, if you look at the Wikipedia article, it will show that there was this... Uh, Ownership dispute. The two nations nearly went to war. The International Court of Justice was brought in and they, had, they gave a judgment. They, they declared the temple belonged to Cambodia and Thailand had to withdraw all the troops. <laughs> so, so that's how these nations and, and, the, and the people of Southeast Asia even today value what is now their culture, but it which which came from India. They value Indian culture more than we value it ourselves. Can you believe it? We in India are completely deracinated. We are all non-practicing whatever, Hindus, Buddhists, whatever. Mm. Most of us. Most of us have no connection anymore with our culture. And when it comes to nations like, uh, like Thailand and Cambodia, they nearly went to war over an ancient 2,000-year-old, no, roughly 2,000-year-old ruined temple. Hindu temple. Both these nations are classified as Buddhist countries. Right? You ask any historian, you ask any sociologist, you ask anybody, they will say Thailand is a, is a Buddhist country and Cambodia is a Buddhist country. And this temple was a Hindu temple. There is no Buddhist element in this temple. It's, ru it's ruined. And still these two nations almost went to war. There was firing. There were troops on both sides. It was almost a warlike situation. I'm sure some soldiers must have, must have died in this in these clashes. So yeah, so the, the Hin so Hinduism or Indian culture, whatever you want to call it, reached these lands at least three thousand years before today, through the great traders of Kalinga, which is, which is and, and th this tradition is still celebrated in in Odisha, uh, the Bali Yatra tradition, the Boita Bandana, and much more. And and we have totally forgotten this. Your Robila Thapars and other historians will not teach you about this. They don't want you to know about this gl glorious, great tradition that, that uh, we had, that the great land of Kalinga had. Okay. They just says, is the story of civilization series by Will Durant still relevant today? I think it's still very relevant today. Obviously, it was written almost a century ago. But the information that it contains is still very true. Much of it, most of it, I would say, is very true. It's very detailed. It's very accurate. It's very interesting. I read it as a kid. I read it as a kid. I don't know how old I was. 10 years old, 12 years old. I was engrossed with these big, thick books. It was more interesting than any novel you read. So these are wonderful books. They are obviously, there is obviously much more information that we have today. Much more, many more discoveries have been made. Much more, much better understanding is available of these civilizations and periods of history that you wrote about, and yet it's still very relevant. I would say if you are really seriously under, uh, interested in learning history, world history especially, it's an invaluable resource. The Story of Civilization by Will and Ariel Durant. Okay. 
प्रशांत अत्तनायक के सेस व्हाट्स योर व्यू रिगार्डिंग इंडिया एंड श्रीलंका आई लाइक इंडिया आई लाइक श्रीलंका आई वुड से आई लव इंडिया एंड आल्सो लव श्रीलंका या व्हेन इट कम्स टू द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन इंडिया एंड श्रीलंका आई थिंक इंडिया एंड श्रीलंका हैव अ very good relationship there have been rocky periods in the past because in the past india's leaders did not prioritize india's national interest and the subcontinent's uh, shared interests and they did the stupid things overall i i i see sri lanka the people of sri lanka as as the same as the people of india yes of of course we respect the fact that sri lanka is a separate nation state and we respect that very much but i think the relationship between india and sri lanka can take the form that the relationship between india and nepal has we i don't see why we need to have passports and visas all that why don't we just have open borders we can have we can have much more integration of the two nations you know i think something like that is actually afoot the two governments especially the sri lankan government has proposed something and that's i think something that's been work, being worked on so the same energy grid a uh, significant interconnectedness in the education systems the the governance systems a uh, free flow of people no visa requirements all that and uh, why can't the people of sri lanka be given the right to come and live in india and work in india the same way the people of nepal are given the same right we are the same people we look the same we sound the same <laughs> you know so it's it's a it's an accident of history that we are two nations separate nations and that's fine we we have no desire to reintegrate sri lanka into india or any such thing we can we can have a united states of extended india in the future right in which we remain separate separate nation states but uh, we are way more integrated than other nations would be so i think there is and sri lanka is a wonderful place great great uh, people great uh, local beautiful manifestation of uh, culture lo- localized culture there uh, beautiful terrain beautiful geography uh, great beaches i think there's a tremendous potential for tourism in sri lanka from the perspective of of adventure tourism and and the nature natural environment that you have and the culture also um so i think the future is really uh, going to be good for the relationship between india and sri lanka and i would like to see much better and much freer people to people uh, exchanges and movements and interconnectivity mm-hmm. so i think i think that's going to happen in the next let's say a decade or so all right uh, let's take some more questions um yeah this is a question i get all the time uh, can i explain about ashoka's nine men the secret society well uh, i don't know if the society exists or not it is claimed it is uh, some books some historians some writers have written about this that the uh, that emperor ashoka or maybe something somebody before him also created a, sister, uh, a secret society of nine great intellectuals and scholars who would preserve india's wisdom and knowledge over the millennia people with specialized knowledge and and you know that sort of thing so i don't know if it's true or not if it's a secret society it's going to be secret right so well <laughs> that's the thing i mean i get this question all the time i don't know i have no idea uh, you will not see any any evidence of this anywhere i mean if there are nine secret nine men today who are part of the society continuation of that obviously if this exists they will not reveal themselves yeah i'm part of the society no you don't do that you keep it quiet so the answer is we don't talk about it if it exists um Kushagra Maheshwari says can you talk can you speak about the Socotra island given its location strategic location can and will any future or current superpower take control of it for example bharat okay good question excellent question let's find socotra it's not really far from india actually you know let's find it on the map it belongs to yemen by the way yemen it is a uh, part of the nation state of yemen so we know where india is we know where the sea of saurashtra is so called arabian sea temporarily so you go there you go eastwards towards our neighboring nations oman and yemen and somalia and you find this little island here it's not so little it's actually quite big this is the island of socotra once again zoom out zoom out and you see where it is in relation to india it is off the west coast of india very close to the gulf of aden off the coast of somalia and yemen now how large is it it's a significantly large uh, island tip to tip east to west it is about uh, 130 kilometers and north to south at the largest extent it's about uh, 43 kilometers it's a large island it has a 
it has clearly it has settlements in cities and towns looks like yeah it has it has some human activity uh, so that is Sokotra. As you can see, it's it's in a very strategic location. It's at the Gulf, at, at the mouth of the Gulf of Aden. Uh, it is at the Horn of Africa. So you can control, it can oversee all shipping and all trade activity coming in from the Suez Canal region. If you if you don't know where Suez Canal is, it is over here. Al Suez, Al Suez, over here. There's a canal that uh, that slices through uh, the Sinai region and Egypt. So uh, that's where all the shipping comes in from, through the Red Sea into the Gulf of Aden. And if you are sitting in Sokotra, if you have a naval presence there or air force presence there, you can control the entire shipping and trade that flows between Eastern Asia and the Western world. Um, very strategic location. And it currently belongs to Yemen. I don't think any other nation has a military presence over there. In the future, if other nations become powerful, they will certainly be tempted. Tempted. The temptation will exist to take control of Sokotra for sure. Because if you have, let's say, a bunch of fighter planes there, you can really take control of the entire region. If you have a naval presence there, a bunch of destroyers, uh, maybe a few submarines stationed there. Aha, good fun. So yes, that's Sokotra Island. Historically, there has been an Indian presence there way before any Arabic presence. I'll not go into the history. But yeah, and if you see the people of Yemen, most of them look like Indians. So there's a whole history there, whole story, whole story there, which will not, we will not open that box right now. Uh, but yes, in the future, if new superpowers exist or emerge, they will certainly be tempted to take over Sokotra. Uh, um, Ritesh Jha says, Sir, like how South Indian kingdoms raided Sri Lanka many times, like that, was there any empire that did the opposite and invaded India? Well, when it comes to Lanka, the, the original inhabitants, see, we, we have the Ramayan story, the, the events of the Ramayan, which happened like several thousand years ago. And we had a king there, Ravan, and uh, there was a population in Sri Lanka, people who lived there, and the, the places still exist. The the, the places mentioned in the Ramayana still exist in Sri Lanka. So, so you had people there. And culturally and ethnically, ethnically, they were clearly the same as Indians. Later on, we had the advent of the Sinhalese people um, with the advent of Prince Vijay into Sri Lanka, who most likely came from Odisha, most likely from Kalinga. So wh what I'm trying to say is that there is no difference ethnically, culturally, genetically, even linguistically, real difference between the people of Sri Lanka and the people of India. Later on, the Tamil people also were, were settled there by the British. And even before the British, I'm sure, there is no real difference, right? So, um, so Sri Lanka has historically, today it's a separate, separate nation state. Historically, it was part of various kingdoms. You had kingdoms in Sri Lanka as well. And there was constant intermarriage between the kings, between the royal families, in Lanka, in Sri Lanka, and the royal families in, let's say, the Tamil parts of India and other parts of India. So you will, you would have had raids from and, and conquests back and forth for sure. Mm -hmm. Similarly, was there any empire that did the, did the opposite and invaded India? I mean, um, please look at the past one thousand years or twelve hundred years of Indian history. It's it's what I call the millennium of humiliation. Humiliation. India was repeatedly invaded by first the Arabs, then the Turks. And over a period of five centuries, they were able to make inroads into India. And they conquered India eventually. And they established the Turco-Mughal Empire. Before that, you had the Delhi Sultanate. You had other things as well. After the, the destruction, after the fall, downfall of the Turkic Empire in India, the so-called Mughal Empire, the Marathas defeated them. Then you had the European rule over India because they were rapidly able to defeat the Maratha Empire. And then there was British rule in India. And that, that, that's why we speak English today. So that's what happened, right? I mean, th that's the past 1,000 years of Indian history. In the past, you had invasions before that. Attempted invasions of India. The Huns tried to invade India. They were repelled multiple times by the Gupta emperors. 
especially uh, Skanda Gupta, the great Skanda Gupta. Eventually, they were able to make inroads into India, but they assimilated harmoniously into the Indian population. They never tried to bring in a foreign religion or culture or language into India. Uh, before the Huns, you had the Scythians and the Kushans, who also were able to invade northern western India and conquer parts of India. And they also harmoniously assimilated into India without ever, without, without ever trying to impose a foreign language or culture or religion into India. So you had multiple, see India is such a large place. You have these back and forth migrations, invasion, attempted invasions, all that. Alexander tried to do that. It cost him his life. Yeah. So it's a, it's a long story. You had so many such instances when such things happened. <laughs> well, Nippon says, what really happened with Chandrayaan 2? We suddenly lost the connection and the rover was not deployed. It went upside down and it crashed. That is, it, it essentially the last moment. So was there some kind of geopolitical reason? Well, what we know is this. The, I, I was up all night. I was on Times Now. I was covering it live. I was, I was, I was part of the panel on Times Now that was covering the live Chandrayaan landing attempt. So the Chandrayaan uh, orbiter was deployed around the moon. It was it was doing perfectly well, and then it it it, it uh, released the 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 Vikram lander, I think it was called, and it it would it rapidly uh, uh, reduced its altitude, and eventually it was to uh, autonomously land, do a soft landing on the surface of the moon. It had its own AI system, its own computer, because the dis distance from the Earth to the moon is not trivial. If you send a light signal to the moon, it takes about close to half a second to reach there. And if you were to get a signal back from the moon, moon it will take another half a second. So there's a delay of one second. And when you're remotely controlling a lander, which is flying in the air, and you want it to land softly and gently, you can't have a delay of one second, or roughly one second, or slightly more than one second. That's why this rover was given uh, an intelligence of its own, and autonomous landing system of its own and we were getting a, a link a relay back to earth of what was happening and that's how we, we knew what what uh, what was a, what a, was a condition of the rover so it was going down towards the towards the lunar soil surface it had multiple thrusters and all that and what we find is that the, the uh, essentially the almost the last minute the rover the lander flips upside down and then it, it had an uncontrolled descent and crashed onto the surface of the moon. And eventually we were able to, a few months later, see the photographs of the crashed lander and rover. It was a dual system. It's a lander which contained a rover inside. Vikram lander, Vikram rover, whatever it was called. Pragyan rover. Pragyan and Vikram, whatever the two components were. So um, the question is, was there a geopolitical reason? Look, it's possible if, that if your communications are not entirely secure or not secure enough, that somebody may be able to hack into your system and take control of your lander or maybe give it the wrong commands or maybe disrupt the communication and, and do something. So it was alleged that some, some foreign power may possibly perhaps have done such a thing. And at the same time, that this thing was happening, the, the landing attempt, there was also a big security breach, a hack into uh, an Indian nuclear uh, nuclear station, which uh, also was quite significant at the time. These things were hushed up, obviously, for good reason, because we don't want to talk about th this too much. Uh, but yeah, two things happened, more or less at the same time. A breach, a security breach, Cyber security breach uh, of an Indian nuclear system, and also the crash of the Vikram uh, of, of the Chandrayaan two lander and rover. So there was speculation at the time that there may have been a foreign hand in this, and the possibility, the probability of there being a foreign hand in this is not zero. It, it definitely exists. Okay. So who was it? What Who was behind this? Was it indeed the case? Well, I think someday the story will come out. All right. Okay. <laughs> Tejas says, is COVID-19 over? Well, if it is, if it is still around, it's COVID-23. <laughs> I think the virus is going to re remain there. 
it's going to become like an endemic kind of virus it's already kind of an endemic virus the media still tries to create this 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 you know this this uh, this hype that cases are rising again enough nobody cares anymore okay it's one of the weakest and mildest viruses that to ever exist of course it killed people that's what viruses do they weed out the unfit people in society that is the harsh reality of life i'm not saying viruses are good but viruses exist you got to de- deal with it so when it comes to vi- virulence and mortality the covid-19 virus was one of the weakest viruses of all time nothing like the mortality rate of the spanish flu for instance which was actually a chinese flu um and various other pandemics that we have experienced this was one of the mildest pandemics of course it killed millions of people because th- that's what happens even the weakest microorganism even the weakest pathogen will take out some members of your population a small sub percentage 0.1% or whatever that's that's bound to happen but overall it's it's <laughs> overall most people gain natural immunity from it most people uh people with pre existing uh conditions people with diabetes for instance people who smoke a lot or even smoke or uh, people with high blood pressure people with cancer people with these pre existing conditions they were prone to you know getting into trouble with covid-19 for most people there was no such issue so uh, india was the nation that uh, was the most proactive india made the best vaccine india inoculated and vaccinated its population in an extremely rapid and efficient manner and for us in india we need to put this behind us okay everybody is vaccinated and we have dealt with the entire situation now the media will st- will keep on trying to create a new hype about covid-19 completely ignore that everybody is vaccinated why do we need more hype now what they are trying to do is they are trying to make make the set the stage for maybe introducing new vaccine booster doses or whatever or start or you know people i will i will not take names but there were certain indian celebrities writers etc who were trying to shell for moderna and for pfizer for pfizer especially especially to bring in the pfizer vaccine into india and now it's so clear that the pfizer vaccine has killed more people than it has saved that's an atrociously bad vaccine and the americans are still pushing pushing for booster doses in the us so so the my perspective was very clear the indian vaccine is the best vaccine it's performed the best the worst vaccine has been the chinese vaccine because it has not saved anybody it has been the most poorly performing the most inefficient vaccine and the most dangerous vaccine has been the pfizer vaccine we in india are perfectly safe everybody is vaccinated so we need to put covid-19 behind us enough and if the media still tries to create a hype ignore them and if they still keep on doing it unsubscribe from them and block them that's what i would suggest okay maybe one or two questions more something i've not taken before shaheen wahman sadegan says historically the justinian plague in the byzantine empire and sasanian empire lasted nearly a century with many outbreaks happening every decade the justinian uh, justinian's plague and later the black death etc these were horrific events uh yeah it totally ravaged the byzantine empire and the neighboring sasanian empire and then you in the in the which century 13th or 14th century you had the black black death in in europe which came later which i think killed a quarter or or a third or maybe a half of europe's entire population disaster horrific disasters so these these were the real dangers that we have overcome our ancestors in india none of these things came none of these horrible plague and other pandemics ever made their way into india for some reason why well ask yourselves why they completely bypassed india and they went all across the other other parts of the world they ravaged china they ravaged central asia and they ravaged europe and also to some extent persia to some extent not as much as europe all right i think we are done for today we have as always huge huge amounts of questions um Yeah I think I think I'm going to stop oh yeah it's 2 hours 10 minutes otherwise it we can do this all night also all day also but yeah let's let's end it over here so everybody thank you very much for the questions thank you for your participation thank you for your viewership and i will see you very soon in the next live stream until then take care thank you very much
and keep raising your standards. Thank you. Bye.